In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death <coughs> by death, and upon the in the tomb, stowing love. <coughs> Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon the in the tomb, is stowing love. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and pop the in the tomb stone in love. This is the Office of Readings for Friday within the Octave of Easter from the Liturgy of the Hours, Volume 2, Lenten Season, Easter Season, Catholic Book Publishing Corporation, New York, New York, 1975. It's now in New Jersey somewhere. <clears throat> page 604 with the hymn Good Christian Men Rejoice and Sing by Cyril Arlington who died in 1955 taken from the New English Hymnal Canterbury Press Norwich, England, UK 1986 Page 241. Good Christian men, rejoice and sing. Now is the triumph of our King. To all the world, glad news we bring. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. <coughs> the Lord of life is risen from a. Bring flowers of song to strew his way. Let all mankind rejoice and say. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia. Thy name we bless, O risen Lord, and sing today with one accord the life laid down, the life restored. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Page 604 in the second volume of the Bravery, the Liturgy of the Hours, 1975. Antiphon 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he alone does marvelous deeds. Alleluia. Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his love endures forever. Thanks to the Lord of Lords for his love endures forever, who alone has wrought marvelous works for his love endures forever. Whose wisdom it was made the skies for his love endures forever, who fixed the earth firmly on the seas for his love endures forever. It was he who made the great lights for his love endures forever, the sun to rule in the day for his love endures forever, the moon and stars in the night for his love endures forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. <coughs> give th Antiphon 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he alone does marvelous deeds. Alleluia. Antiphon 2. He led Israel out of Egypt. His love endures forever. Alleluia. The firstborn of the Egyptians he smote, for his love endures forever. He brought Israel out from their midst, for his love endures forever. Arms outstretched with power in his hand, for his love endures forever. He divided the Red Sea in two, for his love endures forever. He made Israel pass through the midst, for his love endures forever. He flung Pharaoh and his force in the sea, for his love endures forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. For his love endures forever. Antiphon 2. He led Israel out of Egypt. His love endures forever. Alleluia. The Lord rescued us from our enemies. Alleluia. 
and to find three. Through the desert his people he led, for his love endures forever. Nations in their greatness he struck, for his love endures forever. Kings in their splendor he slew, for his love endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his love endures forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his love endures forever. He let Israel inherit their land, for his love endures forever. On his servant their land he bestowed, for his love endures forever. He remembered us in our distress, for his love endures forever. He snatched us away from our foes, for his love endures forever. He gives food to all living things, for his love endures forever. To the God of heaven give thanks, for his love endures forever. Be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Antiphon 3, the Lord has rescued us from our enemies. Alleluia. <clears throat> God has given us new birth to a living hope. Alleluia. Alleluia. By raising Jesus Christ from the dead. Alleluia. Alleluia. <clears throat> a reading from the first letter of the Apostle Peter, from 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 11. Awaiting the Lord's coming. The reason why Christ died for sins once for all, the just man for the sake of the unjust, was that he might lead you to God. He was put to death insofar as fleshly existence goes, but he was living, given life in the realm of the spirit. It was in the spirit also that he went to preach to the spirits in prison. They had disobeyed as long ago as Noah's day, while God patiently waited until the ark was built. At that time, a few persons, eight in all, escaped in the ark through the water. You are now saved by a baptismal bath, which corresponds to this exactly. This baptism is no removal of a physical stain, but the pledge to God of an irreproachable conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He went to heaven and is at God's right hand, with angelic rulers and powers subjected to him. Christ suffered in the flesh, Therefore, arm yourselves with the same mentality. He who has suffered in the flesh has broken with sin. You are not to spend what remains of your earthly life on human desires, but on the will of God. Already you have devoted enough time to what the pagans enjoy, living lives of debauchery, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and wanton idolatry. It is no wonder that these blasphemers are surprised when you do not plunge into the same swamp of profligacy as they. They shall give an account to him who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. The reason the gospel was preached even to the dead was that, although condemned in the flesh in the eyes of men, they might live in the spirit in the eyes of God. The consummation of all is close at hand. Therefore, do not be perturbed. Remain calm so that you will be able to pray. Above all, let your love for one another be constant, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be mutually hospitable without complaining. As generous distributors of God's manifold grace, put your gifts at the service of one another, each in the measure he has received. The one who speaks is to deliver God's message. The one who serves is to do it with the strength provided by God. Thus in all of you, God is to be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion throughout the ages. Amen. Christ died for our sins, the innocent for the guilty. Alleluia. Alleluia. That he might lead us back to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. <coughs> In the flesh he was put to death. In the spirit he was raised to life. Alleluia. Alleluia. He is seated at God's right hand. He died to make eternal life our heritage. <coughs> Alleluia. Alleluia. <coughs> in the flesh he was put to death. In the spirit he was raised to life. Alleluia. Alleluia. From the Jerusalem Catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem in the 4th century, from his mystagogical catechesis. 
Catechesis 21, 3. Combo 1 through 3, Patrologia Greca 33, 1087 to 1091. The anointing with the Holy Spirit. When we were baptized into Christ and clothed ourselves in him, we were transformed into the likeness of the Son of God. Having destined us to be his adopted sons, God gave us a likeness to Christ in his glory. And living as we do in communion with Christ, God's anointed, we ourselves are rightly called the anointed ones. When he said, do not touch my anointed ones, God was speaking of us. We became anointed ones when we received the sign of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, everything took place in us by means of images, because we ourselves are images of Christ. Christ bathes in the River Jordan, imparting to its waters the fragrance of his divinity. And when he came up from them, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, like resting on like. <coughs> so, we also, after coming up from the sacred waters of baptism, were anointed with chrism, which signifies the Holy Spirit, by whom Christ was anointed, and of whom blessed Isaiah prophesied in the name of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor. Christ's anointing was not by human hands. <coughs> Excuse me. Nor was it with ordinary oil. On the contrary, having destined him to be savior of the whole world, the Father himself anointed him with the Holy Spirit. The words of Peter bear witness to this. Jesus of Nazareth, whom God anointed with the Holy Spirit, and David the prophet proclaimed, Your throne, O God, shall endure forever. Your royal scepter is a scepter of justice. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above all your fellows. The oil of gladness with which Christ was anointed was a spiritual oil. It was, in fact, the Holy Spirit himself, who is called the oil of gladness because he is the source of spiritual joy. But we too have been anointed with oil. And by this anointing we have entered into fellowship with Christ and have received a share in his life. Beware of thinking <coughs> that this holy oil is simply ordinary oil and nothing else. After the invocation of the Spirit, it is no longer ordinary oil, but the gift of Christ. And by the presence of his divinity, it becomes the instrument through which we receive the Holy Spirit while symbolically on our foreheads and senses. Our bodies are anointed with this oil that we see. Our souls are sanctified by the holy and life-giving spirit. <coughs> <coughs> you have believed the good news. <coughs> Excuse me. Alleluia, alleluia and have been sealed according to the promise with the Holy Spirit. Alleluia! Alleluia! He is the pledge of our inheritance, the promise of freedom for those whom God is one for himself. Alleluia! Alleluia! To the praise of his glory. Alleluia! Alleluia! God has anointed us and sealed us as his own, as a pledge of what is to come. Alleluia! Alleluia! He has given us the spirit that dwells in our hearts. Alleluia! The promise of his freedom for those God has won for himself to the praise of his glory. Alleluia! Alleluia! There were two everlasting states or abodes, heaven and hell. But Jesus, who came for us, and as St. Peter tells us, the reason why Christ died for sins once for all, the just way for the sake of the unjust, was that he might lead you to God. So we're not predetermined to hell. We're predestined to heaven, but we can reject that. 
we can exercise our will by not responding to grace. It's our choice. And he rose from the dead, he died in the flesh, and St. Paul, uh, St. Peter says, he was given life in the realm of the spirit. But that doesn't mean he's just a spirit. No, uh, spirits don't need resurrection, they're immortal. They need revivification. They need to be filled with grace. And Christ didn't need that, because he is the, the total font of grace. No, he's resurrected to life in the spirit in his body, given an immortal body. And that is our destiny also. Uh, not only for the good, but for the evil. But the evil will go to hell, their, their choice, and the good will go to heaven. And how are they good? By God's grace, by the goodness of God. And then he mentions a third state, a temporary state. And this is to which the soul of Christ descends at his death. It was in the spirit that he went to preach to the spirits in prison. So, uh, what's this prison? It's not a physical place, because spirits can't be held by physical prisons. It's the limbo patrum, the nowhere place of the fathers, of the forebearers, uh, of those before Christ. But I believe it's also purgatory. That's what I think the limbo patrum was, the limbo of the fathers. Because it's a temporary state in which they're informed, in which they're, they're, they're themselves is revealed to themselves their whole life. But more importantly, the depths of the gospel is given to them. Now, people who are in mortal sin, this is not a state that they're in. This is a state for those who are in grace, but imperfectly. Those who are not sufficiently converted or totally converted because the book of revelation reminds us that no sin can dwell in heaven there are no liars in heaven and, and the like no quote-unquote dogs it doesn't mean the animal it means people who have degraded themselves uh so we're to and uh, people can degrade themselves through what uh saint peter lists lives of debauchery evil desires drunkenness orgies, carousing, and wanton idolatry, but also through murder, which is the greatest sacrilege, the, uh, the attacking of the very image of God, and various other th things. But that's the road, that's the way to hell. But uh, purgatory is a for lesser sins and bad attitudes. And uh, we need to give them up. We need to yield them completely. We can't pretend to turn them over to God. We, they have to be totally turned over to God. And that's the reality of purgatory. That's the turning turning that over. That's the, the, the purging by the power of grace. It's not, it's yielding to grace fully and not resisting grace anymore. It's wiping your feet on the carpet before you come into the house. Purgatory is the porch of heaven. And so, uh, so we see this, that Christ who suffered in the flesh for us is truly risen from the dead. And we too will be raised. And we're in this time of resurrection. This is Easter Day. The... Uh, the... Uh, And, and we're going to be uh, brought into the fullness. And it's a great joy to us, and it, it, it carries us on in so much. So we're going to have the reality of death and the particular judgment, uh, which we'll experience right off. And the Catechism, uh, number 1021, tells us 
death puts an end to human life, yes, the time open to either accepting or rejecting the divine grace manifested in Christ. So you can't say, well, I'll, I'll repent of my grave sins in purgatory. No, you won't. Uh, you repent of your grave sins now in this life. The New Testament speaks of judgment primarily in the aspect of the final encounter with Christ in its second coming, but also repeatedly affirms that each will be rewarded immediately after death in accordance with his works and faith, though punished, <coughs> as the case may be. The parable of the poor man Lazarus and the words of Christ, <coughs> the cross for the good thief, as well as the other New Testament texts, speak of a final destiny of the soul, a destiny that can be different for some and for others. And then 1030, the final purification or purgatory. <coughs> 1030, 1031, 1032. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. <clears throat> the Church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the Council of Florence <clears throat> in the 15th century and the Council of Trent in the 16th. The tradition of the Church, by referring to certain texts of Scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. As for certain lesser faults, we must believe that before the final judgment, there is a purifying fire. He who is truth says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this life nor in the age to come. From this sentence, we understood that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age and certain others in the age to come. 1032. The teaching is also based on the practice of prayer for the dead, already mentioned in sacred scripture in 2 Maccabees. Therefore, Judas Maccabeus made <clears throat> atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. <clears throat> 2 Maccabees 12, 46. From the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers in suffrage for them, above all the Eucharistic sacrifice, so that thus purified they may attain the beatific vision of God. The Church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and words of penance, works of penance, undertaken on behalf of the dead. <clears throat> and so there's the temptation to plunge into that the swamp of profligacy, as as St. Peter t warns us of. But uh, to, we don't want to be sucked into the quicksand of habitual sin, grave sin. And, uh, and we're told the reason the gospel was preached even to the dead was that, that although condemned in the flesh that they're dead, in the eyes of men, they might live in the spirit in the eyes of God. So God doesn't give up on us. <clears throat> if we leave this life with, more, with venial sin, <clears throat> or with temporal effects of mortal sin, <clears throat> or attachment to sin in, in, in any way, <clears throat> we can be cleansed of that. The grace of God is persistent, though we can still resist the knock at the door of, the, of our, our lives. <clears throat> but in purgatory, we have the total assurance of, of, of to utter salvation. And uh, it's not uh, the arrogance of presumption that some people have in this life, saying that, well, that uh, uh, I'm in grace and there's nothing, no way I can go out of it. So if I have grave sin or whatever, that's not going to affect me. Oh, it's going to affect you very much so. And so we're called to live in this, especially in the reality of love. Let your love for one another be constant, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be mutually hospitable without complaining. That's 
a real temptation. This is this constructive complaint, the, which is advice, <coughs> uh, this, stating the truth, the truth of our condition and the effects of 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 harmful actions of others, uh, which is is not murmuring, but is uh, a proclamation of uh, the promise of justice. So, which also purgatory is also necessary for the true justice of God. So, and, uh, and we should be distributors of God's manifold grace, channels of God's grace to one another, and putting our gifts at the service of one another. So, neglecting to do that, even if we're in the state of grace, uh, we would need purgatory for that as well, if neglecting in this thing. So, in all of you, God is to be glorified through Jesus Christ. That's our calling, is to glorify God. To God be the glory, not to us, but to God be the glory. Although Christ shares his doxa, his glory with us in the power of grace, in the transforming power of grace. And the Te Deum, on page 1047. <clears throat> you are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father. All creation worships you. To you all angels, all the powers of heaven. Cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not spurn the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you, we praise your name forever. Keep us today, Lord, from all sin. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. And we shall never hope in vain. <clears throat> Eternal Father, you gave us the Easter mystery as a covenant of reconciliation. May the new birth we celebrate show its effects in the way we live. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Since you have been raised to life with Christ, seek the things that are above. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> and on page 269 in the New English Hymnal. Written, A toi la gloire. Uh, written by Edmund Boudry, who died in 1932, and translated by Richard Hoyle, who died in 1939. <clears throat> Thine be the glory, risen conquering sun, endless is the victory thou or death hast won. Angels in bright raiment roll the stone away, kept the folded grave clothes, where thy body lay, thine be the glory, risen conquering sun. Endless is the victory thou or death hast won. Lo, Jesus meets us, 
risen from the tomb, lovingly he greets us, shatters fear and gloom. Let the church with gladness hymns of trial sing, for our Lord now liveth, death hath lost its sting. Thine be the glory, risen conquering sun, endless is the victory thou or death hast won. No more we doubt thee, glorious prince of life. Life is not without thee, aid us in our strife. Make us more than conquerors through thy deathless love. Bring us safe through Jordan to thy home above. Thine it be the glory, risen conquering sun. Endless is the victory thou or death hast won. A toi la gloire, ô ressuscité, à toi la victoire pour l'éternité. Your resurrection, O Christ our Saviour, the angels in heaven sing, enable us on earth to glorify you in purity of heart. Christ, Christ is risen. The dead, by death he conquered death, and to those in the grave he granted life. Christ is risen from the dead. <coughs> by death he conquered death, and to those in the grave he granted life. Christ is risen from the dead. By death he conquered death, and to those in the grave he granted life. Christ is risen from the dead. By death he conquered death, to those in the grave he granted life. 